This is the 13th episode of the Real Emergency Vodcast. Amazing. Today, we will be focusing on the treatment of heat-related emergencies with footage from a road race. Real Emergency is produced in partnership with Hantevi, Real DX, and 410 Medical, and it is powered by Prodigy EMS. I am Hillary Gates, Director of Educational Strategy for Prodigy EMS, and I want you to know that all of our episodes are available to you for CAPSI credit on Prodigy. For those of you watching live today, we'll have a QR code at the end of the episode that you can scan and earn your one hour of free CE. Also, check us out on your favorite podcast platform or the Real Emergency YouTube channel, and don't forget to like and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. So let me briefly introduce our resident experts today. We have David Spiro, who is a pediatric emergency physician and professor at the University of Arkansas Medical System, and he is the chief medical officer of Real DX. Peter Antevi is a pediatric emergency medicine physician, EMS physician, and the founder of Pediatric Emergency Standards Incorporated. We have Zach Dunlap, a critical care paramedic who works as a clinical education specialist for 410 Medical. And today we are joined by two experts in the field. We have Chris Troianos, who is the owner of Sports Medicine Consultants Incorporated. His team has provided care at road races, including the Boston Marathon for 44 years. Looking good, Chris. John Jardine is an uh, emergency medicine physician in Rhode Island. He is the chief medical officer of the Corey Stringer Institute at UConn, and he has served as the medical director for the Falmouth Road Race for the last 20 years. That's the race we'll be watching today. So some tips for watching. If you've never joined us before, this is an interactive vodcast. We want you to weigh in. The panelists will ask for your feedback in the chat or um, on video or audio. Feel free to unmute your mic to chime in, keep your camera on, and you can, again, write questions in the chat. Today, you're going to be viewing footage of the medical tent that's at the end of a road race in Massachusetts. We're excited to talk through these logistics of event medicine, and we will be sharing pearls from our experts who have been doing this work for decades. You'll see multiple runners here who have been admitted to the medical tent because they are hyperthermic. They are treated effectively and rapidly in very cold ice baths. I want you to keep your eyes out for how these protocols and treatments could be implemented in your own practice. So let's get started. Peter, over to you. Awesome, Hillary. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Great to see everybody. Uh, David, great to see you. Uh, Maya. Um, and this is going to be, I'm telling you, one of your favorite episodes because um, as a medical director myself, when I was trying to implement these things, I had no idea what I was doing. I happened to be in Rhode Island. I saw John Jardine give a talk and I intact him after the talk. I'm like, I need those slides. And then big kudos to Prodigy. When I called up uh, James and Mark at Prodigy, I'm like, hey, there's a road race going down in Falmouth. And they're like, we're there. So you're going to see footage that's recent, that's real. And it's going to take you through every single step of the way as we talk about heat stroke. I learned a lot just preparing for this episode, and I can't wait to get started. So, uh, Hillary, you're going to be uh, the person on the chat, and please, uh, we, we ask all of you to do, to do that. And at the very end, we have um, Brian Feinstein, who's with us, who will get him in at the end for something he did that would be even more unbelievable of somebody um, who was having a heat stroke. So um, without any further ado, let me introduce uh, John and Chris. So uh, John, if you wouldn't mind coming in first and just telling us about the Falmouth road race and kind of set up the scene for everybody. Are we talking about a road race where it's 120 degrees or is it maybe a little colder than that? What are the expectations here and what are you thinking about? And then we'll pass it over to Chris as someone who sets up these races so people understand what's involved. So John, over to you. Thanks so much for inviting me and thanks for doing this. I, I think this is so important for EMS and, and that's the reason that we're doing this. Um, so the Falmouth Road Race is held in Falmouth, Massachusetts. Um, it's on the third Sunday in August. Uh, traditionally, it started on the second Sunday, but they moved it to the third Sunday. It is a seven mile road race. It's a point to point race. It um, you know, originated back in 1973. We, we celebrated 50 years this year of the, of the running of the race. Um, and it's a point to point race again, seven miles. It started from one, um, quite frankly, start from one bar to another bar. And that's how it started back 50 years ago. And so now we, um, again, it's held the third Sunday in August. We have um, 
thir uh, roughly 13,000 uh, runners are registered to run. Uh, we also, you know, worry about spectators as well. Um, and, you know, the weather in August is typically hot. Uh, we've had some cooler days, but we, you know, one of the things that we are most attuned to, and, and as we'll see, is, um, is heat illness and certainly exertional heat stroke being, uh, you know, the most important life-threatening emergency. So, um, you know, we've been working with Chris now for several years, and uh, it's, just a, it's just a great opportunity to, um, you know, get our medical volunteers together and, and take care of folks that need help, take care of folks that need help. So before I bring Chris in, what's the temperature? What was the temperature this year at this race that we're going to be watching? I, I, Chris can probably help me with that. I, I think that we, you know, we we try to measure it every year. Um, uh, again, sometimes it's not all that alarming. You know, it may be in the 70s right. or 80s, but but yet the right. humidity is up and, and it's just the right mixture for, um, you know, heat illness. So, so Chris, as someone who has been the 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 logistics guru and the brain behind these races, Boston Marathon and many others. Um, explain to us kind of exactly what you do so that when we see these images here in a minute, we can understand it was you who set all that up. A number of different books, including Dr. Jardine on that. Yes, but I think course. it's a high level of coordination. Um, you know, David, I, I really base a lot of what we do on education. You know, we have at Falmouth specifically around 230 medical volunteers. That's four course medical tents, finish line medical tent, a mobile medical team, but also EMS that supports us. And we actually pull EMS from outside Cape Cod to support it because Falmouth is a small one hospital town that you know is, is surrounded by water on basically two sides. So we need to bring in the assets and the support, the equipment supplies to handle this. So we're not going to be an impact on the community and their normal operation, whether it be EMS or hospital-based emergency room access. So again, it's it's that level of coordination, but education for people to understand. And, and a lot of folks clinically, if most of them are in sports medicine, do not deal with exertional heat stroke the way we do. So to get people to understand, change their mindset to really buy into the, the, the protocols is an absolute must. Going back to the temperature that you asked, Peter, that we, we really don't base it just on temperature. Our overall goal is we use a wet bulb globe temperature to really figure out what we're having. So that's a combination of wind, heat, solar radiation, dew point, humidity, all of that. Chris, and can you can you say that again? It's the it, wet. It's the wet bulb globe uh, temperature. Got it. And we have specialized devices that will tell us what those are, and we've been doing this long enough that if you give me a wet bulb globe temperature with the distance of the field field size we can pretty much almost estimate the amount of encounters that we're going to see that day. So it, again, it's a lot of coordination, Peter, and it really pays off. And we've got some great people at Falmouth working with Dr. Jardine and I to make this work. And I'm going to be asking you questions along the way, but um, I'm one of these people who just want to get right to the video. So we're going to, we're going to start the first clip and we're going to, we're going to give you a couple of clips here today. What we're going to do is we're, we're going to give you that first phase, which is, these folks are coming right off of the race, right into the tent. And so what I want our, our experts today to focus on is really that initial assessment. So James, let's queue up, if you wouldn't mind, the first clip. And we're going to take you through several patients. And what we want you to do is watch how they come in and see if you can detect the signs, some of them subtle, of heat stroke. And John and Chris, if you want to talk over us here while while we're seeing these patients as well. Sure, you can you can see this guy's being brought in from the finish line. And it looks like you know he's obviously very unsteady on his feet. He's lost some motor function. Um, very pale, diaphoretic. Um, we have a, a great group of volunteers that you know, sort of specialize in being right at the finish line, and they will see these folks come in and they know what to look for and get them into the team. My first question is, and I would love to hear the other questions in the chat and from the other experts on the call, is how did you recognize this guy was in trouble? Did, do you have people on the, you know, kind of at the race, at the end, in the middle? How are you finding these people? Because to me, they would all look like the same coming down this race. In mind, when we do these road races, our triage system starts at the finish line. Now, obviously, they're going to be runners that come across that are going to collapse that those are relatively easy but the ones that are coming across that are just we're not certain 
we train our folks, and again, we've got a lot of people who have been doing this for years there, um, talking to the runner. Uh, we want to check basically their mental status. So to start asking them questions, you know, do they know their name? How did the race go? Some very basic things. And if we get some answers that are a little bit off, and that verbal cue is something that would be a start for us. Obviously, if they're unstable um, is another situation. But again, the, the triage starts at that immediate finish line. And that finish line is probably about 30 yards from the opening of the medical tent. So we're able to steer people in and walk them in relatively quickly. And then either we have gurneys or wheelchairs that will bring the runners into the tent based on what we're seeing. So I just want to say that, that, Peter, that, that um, oh, sorry. No, I just want to say that there's something about that runner that makes me feel uncomfortable. Uh, you know, the first five seconds of general appearance that we're supposed to recognize that something is not right. It, and it's probably a combination of his, um, I don't know if that was ataxia, but he just didn't seem like he was steady on his feet. His color seemed off. He was nonverbal. I'm just verbalizing, but there's something about his general appearance that I just want to recognize here that doesn't feel right to me. Right. And that's, and that's, um, that's pretty much it. It's, it's, they don't pass the look test, right? So these, you know, the definition of exertional heat stroke is an elevated body temperature and a change in mental status. So as Chris said, we start talking to them and assessing them right away to see if their mental status is altered. And because that's going to be one of their criteria for diagnosis. Um, all, we also know that the heat affects the cerebellum um, before any other organ. So that's why they lose this hind limb function. They, they get a little wobbly. They lose motor control. Some people collapse, you know, outright collapse. But you could you saw when this guy came in how he was, you know, yeah. unsteady on his feet and, and certainly, uh, you know, a little wobbly to get to their stretcher. But you, I, you love, the word, I just want to say use the word heat stroke because I know that the te classic textbook writings are around heat exhaustion versus heat stroke. And these are the questions that are asked on board exams, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But does it really make a difference whether it's heat exhaustion or heat stroke if we actually define it? Or do you actually want to say at this point, this is definitely heat stroke? Well, again, heat stroke technically by definition is an elevated body temperature above 104, 104.5, depending on who you read and the altered mental status. So we know that, you know, and certainly anybody who's altered this severely in this setting, in the clinical setting of, uh, you know, a hot event, um, uh, most likely is exertional heat stroke. Now there is a difference between heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Somebody will die from heat stroke if they're not treated, right? And we have, a, this is a timely diagnosis that has to be made and treated, uh, you know, in a timely fashion. Heat exhaustion, you know, you give somebody some fluids and, and you know, let, let them rest in the shade and they're, uh, you know, they can get better. So there is a there is a clear distinction that we have to make and we have to, you know, uh, again, treat it rapidly. Before we get to that final part of that clip, which is another assessment, what is that time window, John? Let me share the, a slide here. Um, this, um, you can see that graph with the, right? Yeah. So, so this was a study done back in the 70s, and it was done with rats. And what they did was they heated up rats, and then they sort of watched what happened over time. And you can see, you know, um, one is passive, but one is exertional heat stroke. But you can see after about 30 minutes how, how survival has dropped off, right? So for us, um, you know, our golden hour, so to speak, is 30 minutes, right? So we have about 30 minutes to really, you know, diagnose it, assess it, and get it treated again. This is a this is a you know something that has to be done in a timely fashion, um, and again, it's based on uh, what we know here. And I'm I'm really glad that, you, and I'm I'm really glad that you put that slide up now because everyone on this call is pretty much in the pre-hospital setting. And I, as we get towards treatment later, I want everyone to keep that 30 minutes in mind, and we'll get back to that. So, James, let's get back to that first clip if you don't mind, and let's get to our second patient who's coming into the tent. Um, and, and see what you can see about her mental status. She was an interesting one, yeah. <laughs> for sure. Awesome. We're in section two. This is 60. Yeah. 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 Bitches. So she, John, she's, a, she's alert, she's talking, but she, not really. Not really quite all there, right? So um, we've seen all, all sort of gamuts of uh, you know altered mental status. They can be you know extremely happy, extremely sad, um, 
just uh, you know, kind of goofy, uh, and to to you know, of course, being totally unconscious and, and comatose. So we've seen um, we've seen all uh, all sorts. I have a yeah. question. She she obviously it's the end of a race, but she also seemed like she was hyperventilating as part of. I mean, she seemed altered, but she was hyperventilating. Are many of these patients hyperventilating as well? Is that an anxiety response or is that a physiologic response? That's probably it's probably a physiologic response. I mean, she. Um, I think when you when the clip goes on and you start to listen, I think she came in at um, just over 104 rectal temperature, 104.6, but it continued to climb. You know, typically these people are in the range of 108, 109 degrees um, Fahrenheit with rectal temperatures. Wow. Wow. We saw as, we saw this year we saw as high as 112.8. Um, so John, I just put in the chat because I wanted I'm not trying to catch anybody, but I wanted to hear what our clinicians thought were these temperatures, and most people are guessing around 103 to 106. I bet I know I was totally stunned when I heard John say that there were people who have rectal temps over 110. It's just incredibly. Um, amazing that they that they are still standing. But right. you said something interesting. So I just want to be very clear. You're you're obtaining rectal temperatures on these patients. Is that correct? That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. uh, how, do you, well, how do you do that in the confines of a semi public okay. environment? Well, we um, we do it as uh, as privately as we can. We use a we use a towel or a sheet to cover the patient. We use a um, you know, a typical Welsh Allen thermometer for a rectal temperature. If we decide that they are, you know, above our cutoff of 104, plus they're altered, then we know they're going to be going into a tub. So we use a rectal thermistor. Um, and so that's a, um, you know, a, a, like you would have in the hospital, it's a, it's a um, uh, flexible sort of cord that goes in and stays in for the entirety. And then we have a, a monitors that monitor temperature um, continuously. So I just want to make a, a, just a quick point, Peter. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. That in, 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 in children, oftentimes when we've had a, a previous episode with febrile seizures is, is children sometimes come in and we get a report that the child is a febrile because there's been some, you know, a thermoscan or some other device. But then when we take a rectal temperature of the child, it's 104. So uh, uh, well, just can, so I, can I share? I'm sorry. Can I share yeah. another slide? Yeah, please. Oh, so, perfect setup. Yep. Yeah. Um, this is a study that we did in, can you see the, uh, are you seeing the right, correct slide? Oh, good, John. Yeah. So um, this is a study that we did in Falmouth, and this is a tympanic or the infrared um, tympanic thermometer. And you can see the difference in rectal thermometry versus tympanic. Um, and you can see that if you used a tympanic thermometer, you would miss all but one or two cases of exertional heat stroke. This was done in 2019. We had 30 heat strokes and you can see we detected them all by rectal thermometry. But if you relied on tympanic, you would have missed um, all but two. So I think, I think that um, the next set of clips are gonna be helpful because everyone on this call, John and Chris, they're all saying to themselves one thing, which is, Hell no, we're not doing that, right? right. So uh, let's, but, but, but this is how important it is because this could be life-saving whether you go down one road or the next, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think we're ready for this, the, this, the second set, but before we do that, this next set of clips is gonna be the evaluation that you and your teams go through prior to the treatment. So mm -hmm. uh, John and Chris, you wanna describe um, for us, before we show the, the the videos, what what does that evaluation consist of? I know it's really quick, but what what are well, we doing right now? Here you can see what I described. They have her covered, and they're doing the they're uh, obtaining the rectal temperature here. So you can see that it's you know done privately. It's not uh, it's done discreetly. Um, sometimes you know right through their running shorts or, or whatever they're wearing. Um, so. Again, everybody that comes into the tent that's triaged into the tent that is somewhat altered or that we're, we're suspicious of exertional heat stroke, we get a rectal temperature. Okay, all right. Jane, let's, let's take it away. So the eval is a hit, you're taking the history. Right now, it's just pretty much all rectal thermometer, and that's it. Right, but she, she, I, I, she's asking questions. She's asking a question. Oh, I thought you said, does this hurt? And I'm like, no. Do you have any other electronics? No phone in your bucket. 
I think the one thing to go back to what Dr. Jardine said earlier about the, um, the protocols, and we can share this with our EMS partners as well, is that we have that 30 minute window and our protocol is whether it be on the course or at these tents, that that 30 minute window that we need to pool first, transport second, which is obviously a very different protocol than what pre-hospital is doing. So again, in Falmouth, our EMS folks are ready to do that. They will transport to our medical tents before they go to the hospital if they're expecting or they think any type of heat illness is involved. Cardiac, different situation. Now with Boston, one of the things that we do is we had we get a waiver for all ambulances to be able to transport to our medical tanks if they suspect a heat illness. So that waiver prevents them from having to go to the hospital, which as you know, is done by law. Right, and, and just to add to that, uh, uh, Chris, thank you. Um, in Falmouth, actually, all 911 calls to Falmouth are rerouted through our communications system. We have a communications um, vehicle there from the sheriff's department. So all 911 calls that come in, um, you know, are routed through us. So we know, you know, if somebody calls for a runner down, we know before, you know, it goes out to dispatch or whatever. And as Chris said, you know, we our ambulances and, and crews will bring folks to us before they go to the hospital. Do you also on top of that, if I could, the hospital is also prepared to handle these patients with the same equipment and supplies. So they will do an immersion at the ED in their decon unit if need be. Right. So John and Christopher, after you do treatment in the in the tent, then then does the patient go on to the hospital afterwards? Is that part of your protocol? Not always. Um, we again, we have a um, uh, you know, we have a seven mile road race. So this is, you know, heat strokes over the years. And you can see that the percentage that goes to the ER and we typically will send 90% of the people home from the tent. Um, that is, again, that is because we're comfortable with a seven mile race. We're comfortable with the, the, the dynamics there. We're comfortable with our team. Um, they're sent home with discharge instructions with a family member or friend. Now I'll let Chris speak to his other events where, you know, this doesn't always happen. Obviously people do go to the hospital. I think, you know, again, some of the longer distance events like the half marathons and the marathons where we do see this, I mean, the concern is a secondary issue with exertional rhabdomyolysis. So in a lot of cases, we will send someone that particularly has a higher body core temp or is taking a long time to cool. And I think that's one of the, the nuances. I've all, John and I talk about this all the time. Not one of these is the same every time. They're always different. And one of the things that we're always looking at is the body type. So the young lady that you saw in the second clip, not a lot of body mass. We should be able to cool her relatively quickly. But someone that might be 225 pounds, big guy, 6'2", that body mass is going to take much longer to dissipate that heat in the tongue. So if it's going to take more than 30 minutes, then the likelihood is they may have exertional rhabdo with it. So we need to send them to the hospital to make sure that that's, that's dealt with. So you use the word exertional or secondary rhabdomyolysis. Could you kind of explain that to us and what you really mean by that um, and, and, and how you would recognize rhabdomyolysis? Because that, that is a life-threatening condition in itself. No question. Again, we, we see this a fair amount. I mean, obviously what we're seeing is that the, the, the muscles are releasing protein into the blood, which is causing that, that issue with the blood to just be somewhat toxic in the kidney. So We've got to get them on some type of an IV therapy. And again, with Boston and Falmouth, we do provide IVs, but we're not necessarily checking for that CK level. So that's something that definitely has to go to the hospital for a secondary evaluation. And in sometimes we've had patients uh, up until you know five or six days still admitted to clear their kidneys up. Yeah, and for everyone's knowledge, CK is a, is a, is a chemical or an enzyme in the blood that goes up significantly when you have muscle breakdown. So that's one of the key things that if Peter and I were working in, uh, in the emergency department, we would test for that, uh, you know, usually pre-hospital care would not be able to actually test for, but there are signs and symptoms of rhabdo. And David, we talked uh, in the chat here about um, sodium bicarb um, as a treatment as, uh, in the heat emergency protocol. Let me let me actually back up a little bit too because I know what's on everyone's mind and someone mentioned it in the chat, which is we don't have these thermistors, right? And uh, again, I don't know how expensive they are, but um, what would you recommend to all of us in EMS who perhaps are going to come up on a construction site, you know, not an event per se, but a regular old place where someone happens to have a heat stroke? Right. I I think you I think the um, 
you know, the sort of the over-the-counter thermometers that you can buy at a drugstore, CVS, Walgreens, whatever, um, uh, would suffice. I mean, they have to be able to, you know, record higher than usual temperatures, certainly. Um, but I, you know, I think, and Chris can certainly speak to how much a, th a thermistor would cost these days. But I think, um, you know, just a just a over-the-counter thermometer that you you buy in the store. I mean, look, I, we know that it's going to be a while before we convince pre-hospital to have thermistors in the rigs um, or thermometers. So I think that the one that we use is specialized. It's called Data Therm, and it's a company I think in East Germany that manufactures it. It's not expensive. It's about two hundred and fifty dollars. The thermistors themselves come in a package of five to seventy-five dollars, and they're about what sixty inches long. Mm. Um, and again, it's important, and we talk about this with our staff that that thermistor needs to go into the rectum about six inches to really truly get the right core temperature, and also to remain in that cavity as we're doing this uh, this ice immersion. But Peter, to your point, there there are other methods. I mean, we you don't have to have a fifty or sixty gallon stock tank to do this. You could do this with a tarp. Um, you can actually do this. I know it sounds a little macabre, but with a body bag by putting the patient in the bag and adding water to it. So any method that you can use to cool somebody is appropriate. We're going to get to the, to the cooling part in a minute. Um, yeah, Peter, a couple of questions while we're on it. So one is um, that uh, someone's asking um, with these really high temps that are so shocking to folks, Chris and John, are we seeing like in the guy who has 112 degree temperature, um, is he having any permanent neurological effects or or is there kind of a correlation there or do they recover okay? Well, because they're because they're cool treated and cooled within the 30 minute window, um, mm -hmm. there's no sequelae. So he, you know, this uh this guy went home with his family that night. He saw his doctor the next day. We were we had been in touch and uh, there have been no um you know negative effects. Now, um, you know, you you look at, and if I can, I think I can share another slide here. Yeah, go for it. Um, this is, this is a, a tale of two heat strokes. This is two heat strokes that occurred at the Marine Corps Marathon. One that occurred, uh, the, the runner um, collapsed at the finish line. He went right to the medical tent. You can see he's the dark circles. Um, he was cooled, you know, got a temperature, was cooled, cooled on site, cooled, uh, you know, within 30 minutes and, you know, did fine, went home. The second guy is the gray squares. He collapsed on the um, course at about mile 24, I believe. He was picked up by an ambulance, um, brought to the local ER. And you can see that it took an hour before they even took a temperature. Um, and then they tried to cool him with, you know, ice packs in the groin and a fan. And you can see that it took a long time for him to cool. He had um, renal failure. He had liver failure. He was on the liver transplant list. Oh. Fortunately, he um, did well, did not require a transplant. Um, but you can see the difference. You can see the difference in two. The, again, these are two heat strokes uh, that occurred in the same race, but obviously different treatments. Can I make a, so, point? So I make a point about that second case is that one of my pet peeves or one of the things I teach with learners in the emergency department for many things that kids come in for tra traumatically, such as cardiac arrest. I like getting a rectal temp within the first five minutes of, of when that child arrives. The point is, is that I think oftentimes hospitals, to your point, don't always get a rectal temp or an accurate temp early on in a resuscitation of a patient. But I'm ask, I'm going to ask Peter a question. Peter, what what is the uh, stigma or the barrier to actually getting rectal temps done in the pre-hospital environment as a medical director? You know what? You know what? I mean, um, maybe other people can answer it. Here's my thought process. Remember, we used to use rectal Valium. Remember those days? Oh, yeah. And I mean, the, the day we got the MAD device on, people were like, oh, my God, thank God I never have to do the rectal stuff ever again. So it's something about you know, uh, being in EMS and people just don't want to go down there, if you will. Um, but I mean, it could be something else, but I think it's probably just that easy that we just have to say, this is a life-threatening disease. We need to do the right thing for the patient. Get over yourself and just do it. And let's have Maya weigh in. She's another medical director. Yeah. Maya, what do you have to say? I think um, part of it also, right? We don't train on this. Like I'm trying to think now, I was teaching at my paramedic program. Have I ever trained my paramedic students to take a rectal temp? And I think there's so many things like, for example, when I train some OB stuff, they're like, are we allowed to do that? I'm like, of course you're allowed to do that. The patient <laughs> needs you to do that. 
Um, and so I think we have to sort of demystify and make it clear that it's like absolutely okay to do that. And not only is it okay to do that, it's very important to making the right diagnosis and providing life-saving treatment. Um, but this is like my mental note, like I need to train as part of our EMT and our paramedic programs. Like, I don't think that's anywhere in my curriculum. Good. Very good. Uh, yeah. I think if you, you know, if you came up with a new protocol that involved rectal thermometry, you could certainly, you know, do a training program. It's obviously not that difficult. Uh, you know, athletic trainers learn it as part of their, uh, you know, as part of their curriculum. I mean, it's not, you know, uh, as we know, it's not, you know, uh, uh, that big of a deal. I think it's just, again, getting over that, that hump to say like, this is what we have to do and this is the right thing to do. It is. And that, that was, this was one of the biggest points that I was hoping to get across today is that, and, and Chris and John, for, for all the pre-meetings we've had on this, they just kept saying like, what's wrong with you people? Just do it. Right. <laughs> and I think that's part of the, the, Maya said it beautifully there. So, all right. I think, I think um, I want to talk about the next clip because not all patients, John and Chris are, you know, uh, um, just so nice and just help me out. Right. Some, some of the patients are going to, are, are not going to be as nice. So, uh, if you want to talk us through what this next clip is going to show us, and James, if you can tee that one up. So that's what, that's uh, what just me. happened there. <laughs> yeah, so that's me in the light blue shirt there, and uh, he. Um, this guy reeled back and kicked me and he luckily caught me in the shoulder. I mean, he did lift me right off the ground. Um, but you know, if he, if he hit my face or neck or something, it would be a different story. Um, so again, yeah. That, so there's an alteration in your mental status, right? So that could be that they are aggressive, mean, combative, uh, you know, all of the above, right? It, it's, it covers all, 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 all types. And what, what percentage of the patients do you think are in uh, fit this same category as this gentleman versus the other ones we're about to see who are just like basically laying there saying, help me. Um, I don't know if I have a percentage, John. I mean, I, if yeah. I had to guess maybe five, 10% of that, okay. like yeah. that. That's fair. Yeah. yeah. Fortunately, there not, aren't too many that are, 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 are certainly as aggressive as this guy was. Um, but there, you know, again, there are people that, are, you know, when you say we're going to do a rectal you know, rectal temperature, and they have, you know, just enough hearing to say, oh, no, you're not, you know, and, uh, um, you know, and that sort of thing. But I mean, you know, I think that, um, you know, again, you've seen people that are altered, and this is one, one way that they're altered. Well, Peter, the other thing that's very important in watching that video is, and again, we go over this every time we do the event, is making sure that we're protecting our volunteers, so that they're aware of this possibility and what to do. And, John's point, I've, I've had runners that were, you know, 230 pounds, big guys. We talk about putting a rectal temperature in and they go, no way you're doing that. And they're very uh, verbally combative, but we're able to talk them to get into the tub maybe without that for a period of time. Once they start to calm down, cool off a little bit, a lot of them have allowed us to then put the thermometer in, then we see what we have. I mean, John and I have seen mental status changes that, that run the gambit. Um, some is severe, and I, when we, we teach this, we've actually had some of our models in the tub actually run out of the tent to see what the reaction is of the, the medical staff in regards to doing it, because their mental status is such, you can't let them leave. You've got to get them and put them back in the tub. So it's wow. it's a wide range, verbal and there physical. Been, there have been plenty of races where we've actually, you know, held people in the ice. As Chris said, you know, they they try to get out, they try to get away, and that's the that's the wrong thing to, to do. Certainly you want to, they have to be cooled. They have to cool down quickly. Yeah. So with this, this discussion is prompting many questions. Let's just make sure we're really clear about this. We talked about this sort of within 30 minutes, but how quickly are we cooling them? Um, when do we stop at what temperature when we're reading our data therm? And do we need to worry about any sequelae the same way if you uh, warm someone too quickly, um, seizures or anything else that might, might happen? Um, anything we need to worry about? So well, we, I think we, that, there's a cut. I'm sorry, Jane. Wanna you want me to go? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Yeah. So I, I think a couple of things, and it's important with the setup, is that when we talk to our volunteers about having, you know, if we use 50 gallon stank, stock tanks with about 30 gallons of water and probably two 30 pound bags of ice for that specific tub. And what we don't want to do is we don't want to over ice it so it's a massive ice slurry. 
So what we're trying to do is get that water probably mid to low 50s, you know, in the way of temperature that so the cooling won't be excessive. Now, what can happen, what we do is we're monitoring this data therm from the time that it may go up, but we're really watching it come down. We're watching the rate of how quickly it's going, again, depending on the body type. Bigger guys, it's going to take longer. Some of our elite athletes a little bit quicker. And I think right now, John, we're about 103. So when they hit 103, we take them out because the cooling is still going to continue once we bring them out of the tub. And again, that thermometer needs to stay in the rectum for at least another 20, 30 minutes to make sure they don't go back up or if they rebound down. Great, Chris. And any any worries about um, how quickly these are these people are cooled with uh, other sequelae? Anything medical that we need to worry about? No, there's been you know people who have been in EMS or or in medicine for a long time. There's some uh, misconceptions about putting somebody in ice water, right? You'd yes. say like, well, they're going to vasoconstrict, they're going to shiver. Um, and certainly, if you put one of us, you know, right now who's normal thermic in a in an ice bath, we'd you know our temperature would you know go up probably a half a degree because we'd vasoconstrict and shiver, and and then we would start to cool. But these people that are you know 109, 110, 10, even 107, 108, um, it's all cooling. And uh, you know, as Chris mentioned, we put a couple bags of ice in the in the tubs. These people are melting the ice, um, so that's how warm they are. So it's not right. there's no vasoconstriction, there's no you know there's no um, shivering. You know, occasionally you know when somebody comes out, they're a little chilly, you know, that sort of thing. But um, certainly, the, it's all it's all uh, it's all cooling. And and uh, someone else asked about uh, do we uh, complement this treatment with IV fluids or why not do cooled IV fluids? And I know John, we had talked about this on our prep. Um, can you talk a little bit about that theory? Sure. And I'll, I'll let Chris, again, speak to the longer events. Uh, again, our race is a seven mile race. It's just about 11 kilometers. So we are not, um, we typically don't see people with hyponatremia or, or you know, real bad effects of dehydration. Um, as far as cooled fluids, there have been studies done where the, in the military where they've actually cooled the IV fluids, you know, kept them in a refrigerator, or whatever, cooled the fluids. And then, um, but if you start an IV in the wrist, by the time the IV fluid gets to the shoulder, it's already warmed to body temperature or above. So cooled fluids, again, in these folks, it's not going to do anything. If we start a cold IV in one of us who's normal thermic, yes, our temperature will go down. And that's what we use for the, you know, the hypothermia protocols, et cetera. But in people that are, again, 108, 109, 110 degrees, they're going to warm that IV fluid up before. That's you know. amazing. And just the last thing, because it's the one thing that everybody keeps asking about um, before we watch a few more videos, Peter, um, is this idea of we don't have um, these tanks. We don't have ice. So, Chris, I know you and I talked a little bit about the use of a body bag, and we've seen it in um, in uh, some races throughout the country or medical uh, or sorry, um, endurance uh, races. Um, body bag and water from the fire hydrant. Hillary, yes. excuse me, Chris, excuse me. Can I just share the sure. slide? I'll show you the picture of the, um, sure. yeah, this is a picture of a body bag. So that's, you know, that's, you know, again, if you, if you keep one of these on your rig, it's, uh, you know, it's a convenient piece of equipment, but that's a, so sorry, Chris, go ahead. No, I, again, we've, what we've been told, and I've checked this out with many of my firefighter friends, that the water coming out of a hydrant is probably about mid fifties. So again, that's cold enough without ice to be using this type of a device to really cool someone off. And you know, the things that we've talked about is we're not just dealing with races. What we're seeing with climate change now, this is affecting all of us. I mean, just the last four road races, or some of the like, four road races I've conducted with John, we've had 72 exertional heat strokes. I've never had that happen in one single season. So this is a problem that we're all going to have. And for our pre-hospital folks, when you're, your firefighters are dealing with summer fires, house fires, whatever it may be, homeless in, in Arizona, this is a problem that we're going to continue to have to address. How about we get to the videos? But before I we, we do that, you just gave the EMS medical directors on this call the chance to use a fire hydrant. Yes. Oh. Uh, thank God. <laughs> Love that. Okay. How about we go to the... Uh... Peter, one other thing to, to <laughs> just you know, tag on to that is that... You know, we're talking about athletic events, we're talking about endurance events, but, you know, you, you have to remember as EMS, you are going to be the primary caretakers for our, our laborers, right, the occupation force. So the people who are doing work outside, who are, uh, you know, laboring outside, 
um, they're not going to have a tub standing by. They are going to be relying entirely on you guys. So that's why this message is so important that, that yes, if you're set up for an endurance event, great, but the, it's going to be the people every day that need you that really need this. Love that. Love that. All right. So how about we go now to the treatment? So Chris, we're going to be in one of your tents. John is, is, you know, providing medical direction. You have all these tubs set up. Let's take it to the, now the treatment aspects of how are we now, do we, do we just dunk these people in the ice? Let's take a look and if James can set up this next video here, and then we'll have you guys walk us through it as well. What we're about to see is, is different than I kind of mentally thought about it. I think one thing that's important here to notice is that we're also pulling with him. That's, you cannot just worry about the, the body itself. So we have, every time we do this, we have someone at the head, talking to the, the athlete, monitoring, making sure that they're everything, all their bottles are breathing, heart rate, all that stuff. But you're going to see with this one, where she's lucid now, she's going to start to go out of it again. And this is not uncommon with a lot of our patients. So she, she, she was lucid and now she's going to just go out of it, right? She will in a, in a little bit. I think it, uh, I forgot what Mark. Yeah, right James, now she's talking, James just she's seen, muted there. there she goes. Yeah. 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 James just muted it. You can keep it muted, James. There we go. It's hard to hear. Chris was saying um, that there's always someone at the head. They have um, cool towels at the head as well, but also someone always talking to the person and telling them what's going on. She comes back around pretty quick right here. Yeah. What I found, what I found fascinating is that you have them kind of laying at the top of the tub. They're not, they're not all the way inside it and you have them covered with towels and you're just continuing to put the ice. Can you just describe that process and how you came up with that aspect of it? Well, again, as John mentioned earlier, I mean, the body is going to warm that water up, particularly about an inch around the body. So we, we put two 30 pound bags in and those bags of ice will cool. I mean, evaporate pretty quickly. So to be able to stir the water to, for convention purposes to allow that heat to dissipate is important. Getting you know the legs which aren't in the tub, the cranium cooled with the towels, again, very important, and then continuing to douse. There are three basic methods to cooling. One is using that type of a stock tank. And uh, John and I've had this discussion many times. I would prefer the 50 gallon, and those are rubber made stock tanks. They're actually livestock tanks that are basically indestructible that we use. I don't like going 50 or 100 gallon tanks because it's too much water if it gets soiled. And I don't want that patient to be completely submerged or submerged to a, a more than what you see. You can also use what we call the taco method is an imperial ta uh, tarp. You can put the patient in and dump water and ice in it and have four people on each corner and agitate it. And again, you can still take the rectal thermometer. The final way, which is used by the Marine Corps Marathon, it's used by the Marines at Camp Lejeune, and, and, and some of their other training centers is putting the patient on a gurney over a bigger tub and not not douse, not putting them in the water, but taking the water and pouring it over them. And studies have found that that's a little slower, but equally as effective. But that method does allow for IV access early. Mm. Got it, got it. And James, is there any more left of that video? Or was there another patient in that video? I don't well? think so, Peter. Okay, that, that was it. Yeah. So and Peter, Peter, one one very important thing about this video is that she was initially talking to the crew and was awake and then became unresponsive as she was cooling. Um, there are some people that believe that you don't need a rectal temperature. You can just base this all on mental status. So in other words, they come in goofy when they start to when they start to cool they get clear you can see that th the opposite happened with this young lady so it, you know you can't always base um you know whether somebody's cool enough or they've adequately cooled on mental status alone and again it, it just sort of you know brings back to the importance of rectal thermometry and one one more question um chris that's a lot of volunteers can you send some to us because we don't have enough people to do what you're doing what what's the kind of sweet spot for how many people are helping that many it's a lot i mean as you can see that that treatment is labor intensive to oh. say the least and again we have to have at least four maybe five people per tub Okay. Um, in that tent, that, which is a, I forgot the dimensions, but we have 30 immersion tubs in that tent and double the amount of uh, thermistors and thermometers. So in case one mm. doesn't work well, or if we see when we saw the 112.8, not uncommon for us to change that out to make sure that that thermometer is working the way we thought it was, and it's verified. 
So again, it's it's a lot of people. We have a multidisciplinary crew, um, doctors, nurses, athletic trainers. I mean, ev everyone you can think of, including students. And at Falmouth, we're very lucky to be partnering with KSI, which John is the medical director for. And we have a lot of people that do research in this field. And to have those experts with us helps. So the, so the syncable, excuse me, Hilly, the syncable episode, we passed, we glossed over it. So I'm just curious, what percentage of patients have syncope and what are other adverse effects that we should be aware of if we're performing this therapy? Well, we've, we've had people come in, you know, unconscious, entirely unconscious. They've collapsed, they're unconscious, um, and they're put in the tub in the same way. We just are care very careful to support their head so that they obviously they don't go underwater. Um, but as they cool off, they do start to wake up. And, um, you know, so you do see, again, the alterations can be as as profound as being unresponsive. Um, so, um, and John, are you ever giving oxygen? Are you ever like, are there any other therapies happening here besides the cooling? No, the cooling. Are you checking right. the blood sugar? Are you doing some of the other things? Vital signs. We can, we can check blood sugars. We can do all that stuff. But the the cooling again, because because we have such a a narrow window of opportunity there, we you know the cooling takes precedence over everything. And I think when you talk to uh, you know Brian, uh, the guy who did the um uh, the with the body bag thing. Um, um, you can see that the cooling even took precedence in that case. So I think that, you know, the, the cooling takes precedence if afterwards they're not feeling well or, you know, they need an IV or they need some other care. Certainly we can do that. Um, but but we try to, you know, keep it again to the cooling. And one of the things I was thinking about when she had a syncopal episode is, is there, are there dysrhythmias? Is this patient having some sort of arrhythmic events that we're not actually capturing? And that's, and that's a perfect setup. So Brian Feinstein, thank you for joining us today. You wrote a paper that we saw on the internet. Hillary and John were like, that's crazy. And I, I, I found you on LinkedIn and you're like, I'll be there. So Peter, was, Peter, that's the second time you've said it's a perfect setup. So I mean, it, it's almost here. like you and I've talked before this, which we didn't. <laughs> so Brian, tell us about your case um, and the, the, high, the, the heat stroke case you had and what you did. Yeah, no, th thanks so much for having me. I, uh, I appreciate uh, you reaching out. I totally forgot that I even had a LinkedIn account, so <laughs> that was a surprise. Um, yeah, I, my, a quick background. I was a critical care paramedic and had a background in search and rescue. I've worked in national parks in Grand Canyon, um, went back to medical school, um, did residency in Phoenix. So that's where this, this case kind of evolved from. Uh, we as part of one of my QA projects in residency, you, always, you kind of have to do one of those. Um, and I was seeing that there wasn't a good treatment to heat stroke. Um, and we, in Phoenix, the temperatures get up to 120 during the, you know, during the daytime. Um, and what we've been talking or what everyone's been talking about and what has been talked about in the literature for a while is the exertional heat stroke. Um, there were a few case reports of people using uh, this immersion method of cooling for classic heat stroke, just, you know, older patients that have comorbidities that aren't healthy athletes that they're putting them in immersion therapy. And that's kind of where I got this idea to protocolize in our emergency department at um, Maricopa County Hospital, which is the kind of the safety net hospital in Phoenix. Um, Cause we would see during hot days over 110 Fahrenheit, multiple people coming in with body temps of like, you're saying like crazy body temps of 108, 109, 110 sometimes not even reading. And these are patients that aren't running marathons. They're just hanging out, passed out, either, you know, homeless people on the sidewalks that just kind of cook uh, in the summer heat. Um, so it's it's a really disadvantaged population. And um, you guys did an amazing job of just uh, laying down the importance of, of recognizing this, getting that rectal temp, and then just the number one priority is cooling these patients. Um, it's in my in my opinion, it's like a time critical diagnosis, just like STEMI or stroke, um, that we should have a goal to, to to initiate this treatment and recognize it and treat it. So, we implemented this where everyone bought in the emergency department. So we were using body bags um, with pre made pre made ice um, to cool essentially anyone that came in. So anyone that was suspected of heat stroke immediately got a rectal temp. Um, if it was more greater than 104, they would start getting cooled immediately. Uh, we were able to get it, you know, kind of choreographed. So people were able to, um, 
you know, get better at this. The first time it didn't go so well, but after you do it a couple of times, the staff and the nurses and the techs get good. So we can do IVs. Uh, these patients are, like I said, are not healthy athletes. These are people with heart disease and COPD. And, um, you know, they come in critically ill, like blood pressures in the 40s to 50s. Their heart rates are typically like 160 to 180. And from what we've seen, nothing fixes this. Pressors don't fix this. Nothing uh, improves their hemodynamics until you cool them. Um, so we start cooling them, do everything in conjunction uh, at the same time. Um, we can intubate while they're in the bag. Um, and in this case, we uh, I won't take credit for this because I was not involved in the case. It was one of my co-residents, uh, Dr. John Kelly, um, who was actually the lead uh, treating this patient. And I, I just thought it was so important that we get this out there because um, I think it'll save lives that I, I uh, I've kind of pushed to write it up. But it was a, um, I believe she was 61 year old female, came classic heat stroke, came in. Uh, her core temp was 107. We got, you know, pre arrival from EMS that this was suspected heat stroke. So we had things set up. She ended up, you know, being very tachycardic, hypotensive, ended up going into uh, VTAC. So we had her on the monitor, ended up going into VTAC. Uh, had good pulses at the time, uh, had an adequate blood pressure, but then became hypotensive. Uh, we had the pads on beforehand, um, which was kind of fortunate. Um, and the decision was made to, to cardioavert her because she became increasingly hypotensive. Um, so she got cardioverted while in water, uh, which is probably uh, <laughs> hasn't really been studied. Um, and it works. So. And who made that decision, Brian? I mean, who did you say, let's do it? Oh, so I was, like I said, I, was, I wasn't there. Um, okay. I wish I was. Uh, but yeah, uh, John Kelly, who's the resident, and uh, Dr. Pat Connell, who's one of our, um, you know, he's, he's been around for a while. One of the attendings that's been there for a while kind of made the decision. And um, it was like, do we take him out? Or, you know, do we take this patient out and stop the cooling? Uh, when we, we've seen, we, we would get probably, 30 to 40 of these a summer. It's every single day we see um, multiple patients. And that's, that's just at our hospital. It happens at every single hospital in Phoenix because we rotate around the, we rotate around um, at different hospitals in our residency and every other hospital, we'd see the same thing. So it's happening, you know, probably 10, 15 cases a day, I would say. That's I great. don't have, I don't have actually data on that, but um, yeah. it, and so, yeah, so they just made the decision based on what we've seen in the past that, you know, stopping cooling is probably not, you know, not ideal. So they ended up just doing it. It converted her. She ended up going into cardiac um, PA, cardiac arrest a couple minutes after that. Um, they did CPR on her while she was in the bag being cooled. They ended up getting ROSC. Um, and this is a pretty wild case um, that she ended up going to the ICU and she was actually um, extubated and she was, um, discharged. It took longer than we wanted, um, to get her to our goal temp, which is 1022, which is 39 Celsius. Uh, they had her out at 46 minutes from hospital arrival to that temperature. Um, ideally you want to do it, you know, as fast as possible, but that was, that's pretty phenomenal given, um, kind of her critical, you know, illness. Um, and then she was discharged uh, neuro neurologically intact to a sniff, I believe, on uh, hospital day five. Um, well, so well it's Brian, Brian, just for the sake of time, um, I know Hillary did put in the uh, the the link in the in yep. the text. Mm -hmm. um, that's an incredible case, and I think you also just helped us understand really better exertional versus classic. So thank you for doing that and understanding what the hospital would see perhaps differently in a different patient population, but. Um, I, I did want to end on a good note, which is some video of how these people look at the end. So, yep. James, yeah, let's uh, let's do that. And uh, John and Chris, if you can walk us through uh, the outcomes of these patients and why EMS should be waiting on scene, and and you know until that threshold that you mentioned earlier, before we just rush and take these people to a hospital that likely doesn't have a setup um, that uh, perhaps a athletic trainer at a high school would, for example. So. Uh, James, if you can take us to that last clip. Thank you. So, John, if you want to, or Chris, either one of you walk us through this. 
So these are these are patients that are recovering after the tub. They um, again, we keep the thermistor in. We make sure that yeah, see how happy he is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we you know we keep the thermistor in to make sure that they don't you know shoot back up. There that's happened occasionally, and then just to make sure that they don't get you know too chilly. Um, uh, you can see this guy's a little chilly, but uh, again, we uh, you know they recover if they're normal thermic, good vital signs, taking PO. Uh, they, they go home from the tent with family. And again, that's our, our protocol for the shorter races. Certainly for longer uh, races, they, you know, or, or events or whatever, they would have to, you know, go to the hospital. And is John, uh, John, is there a standard number for the uh, temperature for them to be kind of released or? No, we don't, uh, you know, they're, they're cooled sometimes. Um, occasionally they'll get a little chilly. They may go down to like 98, 95 sometimes. Um, because we think the hypothalamus doesn't reset quickly enough. So, you know, when we were in a warm weather event, we just put them right back out in the sun and they, and they, you know, give them dry clothes and they, and they come right back up. So they're not going to- At what point though, John, can, can EMS say, okay, we're ready to roll and, and, and get out of the tub if you're at a high school, as an example? Well, we, yeah. So, so as Chris mentioned before, our cutoff, our, our uh, number is 103. Um, so if we cool to 103, or if you come on a scene and somebody's cooling, you know, when they get to 103 and they come out of the tub, as long as they don't shoot back up, you know, give them a few minutes, whatever, um, they are then safe to go with the EMS. And that's, and you know, that should be the protocol. And, and uh, you know, as we, as we talked about, um, you know, this is a timely diagnosis. I work in Rhode Island. Uh, the EMS protocols in Ro Rhode Island five years ago changed that people in cardiac arrest, the, the EMS crews were staying on scene for 30 minutes doing CPR. And I was like, what, you know, where's, where's the, the data for this? And there's a big study out of Japan that showed if you stay on scene for 30 to 42 minutes, you know, these patients are walking out of the hospital. So, you know, we can do that with heat stroke, right? So stay on scene, 30 minutes, uh, you know, cool first, transport second. That's our, that's our mantra. So with, with, with that, let me bring in our resident expert, critical care medic, uh, Zach Dunlap. So Zach, you're listening to all this. What are you, what are you thinking now that you hear all this? <clears throat> the first thing I was thinking is how I'm going to call you or, or Dr. Dorsett and say, hey, I've had somebody that was unresponsive with a heat stroke of 109 and they want to go home now. Um, <laughs> so I think that that's important for us to just understand is what is that fine line and uh, Dr. Jardine just did a great job, I think, of explaining what those should be, that getting that temp down, making sure that they have been cooled for at least 30 minutes. Um, it's just, I think it's just something we're not, we're not used to. A couple of things today, you know, I'm in Houston, it's hot here all the time. Um, you know, convenience stores have ice bags of ice everywhere on every corner. So that's something that I know folks have used in the past when you're looking for resources. Um, the athletic trainers here locally are very versed in this and do a great job. So I think it's just important for us as medics to understand, you know, sit on scene, go through the process uh, and make sure that every criteria is met if you are going to let them go home. Yeah. And I think the other important part is if you do come on a scene where somebody is already cooling, you know, wait on scene, you know, until they're down to 103, 102, 103 and then transport. Um, you know, we've, we've seen bad outcomes where, you know, patients have been put into a tub by an athletic trainer, EMS comes and take them out of the tub. And then, you know, they, they have bad, uh, you know, bad sequelae. So and that was actually a case in, in Florida, unfortunately, where, um, you know, apparently the kid was just uh, brought to the hospital. Um, I personally have had to do a lot of work at my agencies to just to, we went to all, all the high schools. We looked at their tubs, we had rectal thermometers, we, we shook hands and so forth. So I would um, really hope that everyone does that for your community, but then also consider the fire hydrant, the body bag, going to the store to get the ice, but just doing the right thing. It's just like whole blood, it's just like cardiac arrest. It's just like hypoglycemia and a seizure. We take care of the problem before we bring them to the hospital. So uh, with that, we're right at the top of the hour. What I wanna do is I wanna give Chris and John the last couple of words. So Chris, we'll start with you. And then John, you'll take us away and then we'll pass it over to Hillary. Well, Peter, again, yeah. thank you and to Hillary and the group for allowing this to happen. Again, it's something that we know is going to take time to change. And what I would offer to the group that's watching this, if you want to come to Falmouth next August, I can't guarantee that we're going to see 30 or more exertional heat strokes, but you will see heat strokes. So if you want to come in and experience this with us uh, together, we'd love to have you. Thanks, Chris. John? Yeah, thank thank you for inviting us and thank you for doing this. Uh, again, you know, 
if you remember one thing, cool first, transport second. Um, that's the key. You know, get somebody cool before you start to transport. You got 30 minutes. You know, you know that's our sort of golden time is that is that 30 minute window. So, you know, do what you can first before um, you know getting to an ER because, you know, quite frankly, we we're not so good at it in the ER, right? I, I think uh, you know you'll be good at it out there. Awesome. Well, let, let me pass it over to our star teammate, Hillary Gates. <laughs> and on behalf of myself, David, Mark, Maya, Rob, uh, Zach, and we thank you guys very much. Hillary, take us away. Thank you so much for your uh, chat today. It was one of the most active chats I've seen in a long time. And Peter, uh, thank you for, for driving. Chris and John, thank you so much for, the, um, for coming. Thank you for coming today. Have a great afternoon.